Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'm Richard Bennett, a senior research fellow at IPIF. And in case you don't know about IPIF, we're a nonpartisan uh, public policy think tank um, that focuses on innovation and growing the tech economy. Um, we're lucky today to have uh, two distinguished speakers on the subject of competition and network markets. And, with, and as we probably all know, since the passage of the 96 Telecom Act, competition has been a cornerstone of communications policy in the United States, for better or for worse. Yet, despite that history, uh, it still seems to be a, a subject that generates a lot of confusion. Um, there was a hearing recently in the Senate Subcommittee on Antitrust, Competition Policy, and Consumer Rights on the proposed transfer of some fallow spectrum from the cable companies to Verizon that I think kind of illustrates the, uh, the nature of, of this confusion, if I can use such a strong word. It, if the deal goes through, Verizon ends up with the second largest portfolio of spectrum in the United States. Um, after Sprint, actually, and ahead of AT&T. If the deal doesn't go through, Verizon still has the second largest portfolio of spectrum in the United States, ahead of AT&T and behind Sprint. And one of the critics of, of the uh, of transfer, Kim Wu, said the deal affects the very competitive structure of the communications industry difficult to see exactly how that analysis flows from the facts. Um, and, and I think what, what it illustrates, though, is that although competition is the stated goal of our, of our policy framework in the United States, there's still a constituency that, that insists that uh, communications is still should be treated as if it's always a, as a regulated monopoly, even in non-monopoly situations. Um, the internet, you know, really has complicated things. It's complicated the job of regulators and policymakers because the relationships that the internet has enabled are so complex in relation to the way the old Ma Bell black telephone rotary dial network world, you know, operated. Um, it really, ever since the 80s, we've talked about the relationship of firms in the network economy as coopetition. So you had companies back in the 80s like Novell and 3Com who were competitors in some markets but cooperated in other markets. So 3Com made network interface cards that enabled Novell's network software to operate, but they also sold their own network software. Oh, and by the way, Novell also sold their own network interface cards. And so these, these firms, it was very difficult to, to characterize their relationship in traditional terms. And, Something similar happens today between firms like, say, Google and Samsung. So Google builds the Android operating system, which is on so many of the Samsung phones, but Google, with the acquisition of Motorola Mobility, is also a competitor in, in mobile phone hardware. Um, so what, what emerges from this, I think, is the notion of platforms. And platforms being systems that add value to networks and enable others to innovate. For example, Google Maps and Facebook are platforms. Google Maps has APIs that let application developers get information from the map system and then build applications on top of that. There's a little application that tells you where the nearest metro stop is in DC, for example. Uh, that works that way. Facebook enables a whole variety of applications like the, the games that people play with Facebook. And so these platforms, Facebook and Google Maps, are built on top of the internet. The internet itself is another platform. It's, it's essentially a layer of software that runs on top of broadband networks. And so the relationship of these platforms to each other, it, engineers characterize that as using the word recursive, where, which I won't try to explain that. I just always like to use the word recursive on Capitol Hill whenever possible. <laughs> Uh, to watch people's eyes glaze over. But it's very different from the world of Mobile and the black rotary dial phone. So our speakers today are leading thinkers in the analysis of network markets and, their, and the impact that they have on consumers. 
We have Anna Maria Kovacs, who's a visiting policy scholar at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, a former industry analyst whose area of focus is the interplay between public policy and investment. Uh, she's followed the communications industry for over 30 years and beginning with a very strong foundation in comparative literature with, <laughs> with her PhD from Harvard, which uh, helped to prove that a liberal arts education is in fact a good investment. <laughs> <clears throat> and I say that with a PA in philosophy. <laughs> um, and Jonathan Sallet, a partner with uh, McElhenney and Myers, LLP, former chief uh, counsel to MCI uh, and later MCI WorldCom, one of the implementers and designers and architects of the Communications Act that I referred to. Uh, Jonathan was a member of a small group of administration officials who met regularly with uh, Vice President Al Gore to invent the internet. <laughs> Mm, Look so how can, it worked out. You can <laughs> write, do you guys use it every day? I mean, okay. Good job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he has considerable expertise on the implementation of the, of the telecom act. So without further ado, um, Anna Maria will begin. Okay. And uh, the first test will be whether I can get the slides. Um, Excuse me. Which, incidentally, for any of you who want to mention pick them up, slides and copies of our papers are over there. You want to get. Um, I'm taking a slightly different perspective from the one Richard took and looking at this from the perspective of consumers and what it is that consumers want and how regulators um, ought to be starting to look at the picture from the perspective of what consumers want today as opposed to what the picture was at the time of the act 15 years ago. And the key difference I think today from 15 years ago as we're all aware is that the act wanted to create a lot of competition and it has been more than successful. There is indeed a tremendous amount of competition at all levels of the broadband ecosystem, the internet ecosystem, both at the network level, at the service and application level, operating system level, device level, all of those are, is a tremendous amount of choice. And what consumers are doing is, in fact, mixing and matching all of those things, depending on where they are and what they want at that particular moment. So at one point in the day, you may be at home using a phone. At another point in the day, you may be out of the house using a tablet or in the house using a tablet, whatever, to communicate. And so as a, a result of the abundance of choice, I think we really need to start rethinking what regulation is and what the role of regulators ought to be so that they are adding value to consumers rather than subtracting it. So. Um, what I think we need to think about is that it is time for regulation, which in the act is pretty much one size fits all within each silo, uh, the silos being telecommunications, cable, broad, uh, broadcasting, et cetera, wireless, et cetera. What we need to really start thinking about is what consumers are vulnerable and what consumers are not, and only focus regulation on the relatively rare cases where they are vulnerable. And also look at when markets are responding to what consumers want and when they're not. So that if you look at that diagram, it probably the one thing I would really like you to take away today is that diagram. And the upper left quadrant of that is the situation in which you have vulnerable consumers and some sort of market failure, not a lot of competition. Think about very high cost rural areas where uh, you may not have broadband available yet, for example, or thing which is addressable through uh, universal service, or think about uh, low-income consumers, which is addressable through lifeline, but as opposed to being addressable through general rate making. So 
to me, really, the key issue is to move from a situation in which an entire map is covered in a one-size-fits-all by regulators, as if regulation were appropriate to all cases, and starting to figure out in what targeted situations it actually is appropriate. When you think about what communication is today, which is very different from what it was even 15 years ago at the time of the act, when people basically had their home phones, which were very different from the cell phones, which were pretty rarely used in those days, very little other than data flowed over, voice and, and data flowed over uh, the telco and wireless networks, and that was clearly divisible from what cable did, from what broadcasters did, whatever. Today, as most of you in the audience are way more aware than I am, people communicate in all sorts of different ways, and they interchange. You know, if you want your significant other to pick up your kid after school, you might make a call, you might text, you might email, you might do any number of different things. If you want to communicate with a friend, you may make a call, or you may be playing a game. I mean, there, it is a totally different world and all of these things are being substituted for each other and all of these things have essentially become one market. Um, similarly, the network path pathways have become somewhat, more than somewhat interchangeable. Switch telephony, voice over IP, wireless voice, uh, cable broadband access, DSL, fiber to the home, wireless broadband, satellite, all of these are ways that people are make, doing those interchangeable communications and are, again, mixing and matching these depending on where they are and what is appropriate to them at the time. I won't belabor the point, but again, there are any number of devices, um, services, applications, etc that have become part of communications and that are used interchangeably. Point being, the silos that are in the Communications Act are obviously no longer appropriate definitions of the market, whatever the current market definition ought to be. And regulation, which really views consumers as a homogeneous body that all need the same rules, have become very heterogeneous it is a very segmented market. The segments can change instantaneously or which segment someone is in. People move in and out constantly. It is a very dynamic market as opposed to the static market for which the act was written. I'm gonna focus on just a couple of examples here. Um, and the, the one that really kind of inspired me to write this paper is is this one, I was looking at um, the results towards the end of last year, uh, third quarter results, and it really, and at the same time, had been attending um, some regulatory meetings. And it really struck me that um, the incumbent's market share had gone down to 45%. Let me phrase this in a, a different way. Only 45% of households have a POTS connection anymore, a plain old telephone connection anymore. 12 out of the 45% say that they use wireless mostly. So even though they still have the home and the home phone, what they are actually using is wireless. So if you look at what consumers use for in-home narrowband connections, only one-third of those consumers are actually really using plain old telephone as their primary means of communication. And yet, if you talk to federal regulators, state regulators, local, anyone and everyone who has something to say about the market, that is what they are hell-bent on continuing to regulate in the way that they have regulated it all along. And that struck me as something that is not very constructive um, and pretty puzzling. 
by what definition is a third of the market a dominant player is one obvious question. The other question is, what is useful when two-thirds of consumers have said, this is really not what we want. And we're pretty emphatic about it. We've left. We've gone to other modes. What is useful about continuing to demand that? And furthermore, what is perhaps counterproductive about continuing to demand that? The features, the pricing, etc. If you are, if our goal as a country is to have a high level of broadband adoption, is it constructive to have a very low basic price for narrow band? Or would it be more helpful to provide incentives to people to move over to broadband? And if the reason you have the low price is that um, they can't afford more, then clearly you want to help, but perhaps the help ought to be broadband lifeline as opposed to a low general one size fits all basic rate for plain collecting. Um, so there are a whole range of questions, it seems to me, that come up from looking at that and recognizing that what was once 100 at the time of, of the act, essentially close to 100% of the market, is now really the preference of only a third of consumers, and that means it ought to be treated very differently. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on doing these sorts of things, but obviously the other thing we need to think about is broadband. And here again, there are a whole bunch of different choices. With the, this is out of the NPIA um, Exploring the Digital Nation uh, white paper. And 42% of the market is using cable modem, 30% is using BSL, and then the rest is a variety. This is 2010 data. Given that smartphone penetration has risen by somewhere between 40 and 50% in the last year, Clearly, the, the uh, mobile broadband piece is now a lot bigger than it was a year ago. But again, what the point is, there's really no one dominant technology here. What matters is that people are able to figure out, right now, I want to download a movie. I'm going to use a lot of bandwidth. This is an appropriate use for my cable or fiber or DSL connection. Um, or I can turn that into Wi-Fi so I can get it on my tablet and not use up any of my capacity on, on my um, wireless bill. One way or another, what people are doing is, you, consumers are doing, is again mixing and matching depending on where they are and what it is they want to do. And the important thing it seems to me is that that's exactly what regulators ought to be encouraging that is what you want people to do. You want consumers to get what they want, you want investment in the sector, and that means you want innovation, which means you do not want to create the kind of delays that regulation for better, or in some cases for better, in some cases for worse, but regulation generally comes with delay. That does not generally help innovation. So again, just a couple more slides here to look at in terms of wireless, according to the FCC's shift in competition report, there are at least six providers for three quarters of the country and four or more for about 95%. If you look at mobile broadband, again, uh, you're looking at uh, something like 90 plus percent have more than two and something like 70% have four more. So both in terms of platforms and again devices, et cetera, there is a wide range of choices. And um, if you look at uh, narrowband, what I think I really want to highlight is the, not just who the players are, but also that there are a whole range of plans. You can now get free either through Lifeline or you can get free through over-the-top voice over IP in a number of situations. 
So the competitive picture, again, in terms of pricing, is radically different from what it was even just a few years ago. If you look at broadband, again, you have a wide range of price plans, prepaid, postpaid, et cetera, um, both for wireless and wireline. So you're looking at an enormous range of choices on every level. That includes devices, apps, et cetera. So the bottom line out of all of that is to me is that consumers need to understand that they are not dealing with a homogeneous box, excuse me, regulators need to understand that they're not dealing with a homogeneous body of consumers. The consumers vary, have a lot of choices, are happily exercising those choices. So regulators really need to start thinking about where is it they add value as opposed to where it is they actually subtract value. Raising the cost of a major sector of the industry is not productive because it will ultimately eliminate that as a choice for consumers. So if you are forcing phone companies to do things that consumers don't want and are thereby raising their costs, you are ultimately going to eliminate those companies as a choice for consumers, which is not particularly helpful for consumers. Um, so the key question I think that regulators need to start rethinking is not only the sort of traditional competitive analysis, who is or is not dominant, which given the statistics, pretty hard to say anyone really is or any sector is, but more I think the, the focus ought to be what are consumers looking for? Why do we need to intrude given all of the choices they have and if we do intrude, are we going to actually reduce the number of choices rather than add, add to them? And so, again, I come back to the, the graphic which says, and, and where the quadrant lines are and the quadrants are is going to be somewhat different depending on, on where the market is. In some cases, not exactly half the market is going to be vulnerable and not exactly half the market is going to have perfect competition. I would argue that in most cases now that upper left quadrant is a pretty small space, whereas 15 years ago it was probably a much larger space than, than it is even depicted there. But that is really the one area where there is justification for regulation and that regulation should be targeted, strategic, very carefully designed to deal with those particular issues that are actually a problem for vulnerable consumers. Again, examples would be um, the TRS and VRS, telephone relay and video relay for folks who are either hearing or, or sight impaired. Clearly that's an audience that needs some help. That help needs to be targeted and is quite carefully to them as opposed to being generally applicable dealing with issues like ability to pay is much better targeted through lifeline than it is through general rate regulation. Um, dealing with issues like availability, again, for whatever may be right and wrong with it in specifics, the concept of the high cost fund is a very good way of dealing with the issues of uh, rural consumers who do not have access to broadband. So um, that's Basically, my, uh, my presentation, consumers have choices, they're exercising them, regulators should as much as possible uh, make sure they're not reducing those choices and getting in the way of consumers having the opportunity to exercise them. Jonathan. Great. Catherine, what do I need to do to get to this? Okay. Okay. I'm going to stand up if that's okay. I know there's a camera operator who needs to adjust to this. So. It would be easier for me to stay awake during my own presentation. If, <laughs> I, <laughs> if I start to drift off or do email, please just stop that. <laughs> um, so Anne-Marie has done such a great job in talking about how regulation should be conducted, enforced, created, that I want to take a different perspective on it. I want to talk about this from an antitrust lawyer's perspective. So. What does antitrust law do? 
It asks basically three questions, each of which, by the way, fill tones. But there's basically three questions. What's the relevant market? In other words, what is the competition that's going on? There was a case well known a couple years ago about Whole Foods in another supermarket or a merger of two uh, such places. So the question was, what was the market? Was it for organic food? Was it for produce? Was it all supermarkets? That's the first question. You have to know how the market works. Second question is, is there a problem? What's the nature of the problem? It could be a dominant firm. It could be people cooperating in ways that are improper. And then third, if one has defined the market and found the problem, what's the solution? And the solution in antitrust law is tied to the scope of the problem. So the people who created the problem who need to be, the conduct that needs to be remedied. Basically, all I'm going to say for the next few minutes, but I'll say it in many convoluted ways, is that we have forgotten the fact that the core of communications law in this sector came from an antitrust decree. It came from an antitrust problem, and it became an antitrust solution. But, what, but the law has become untethered from the first two and three parts of that analysis. What's the relevant market, and how is it operating? What's the problem that needs to be solved? And therefore, what's the right solution? What I'm going to do in the next few minutes, and I'll take the slides probably in slightly different order than they come up, is to try to show you why I think antitrust approaches would be better as a way to confront problems than the old form of regulation, OK? Because it will focus us not on what markets were like yesterday, but on what's going on in the marketplace today, which I want to suggest to you is different than people have generally thought about it. So if I can work this. So let's just go back. We could go back a long further than this. We could go back to 1913, when the AT&T monopoly was really created in the sense of a public policy deal that said we're going to trade off a lot of stuff in order to get a regulated monopoly that reaches everywhere in America. We could go to 1984, when the old AT&T was broke up through judicial decree. Uh, but I want to go to 1995 and 1996. Two big things happened. The internet is privatized in 1995, by which I mean the backbones become private. There isn't a lot of activity on the internet in 1995. I did a presentation in 1995 that was a huge success. I mean, the best presentation I've ever done, and this is what it consisted of, showing people pictures of web pages because they had never seen them before. <laughs> Correct? Right? So, 19, the internet gets privatized, and there's a lot of talk of convergence. There's talk about Al Gore a few minutes ago. I worked on a speech that Al Gore gave, I think, in, in this period, 94, 95, where he said, we're going to have all companies that end up going to be doing the same thing. We won't know one from another. We're going to have convergence. These current markets are going to come together. 1996, Telecom Act replaces the judicial decree with a law. But that law is really an antitrust law. It's designed to deal with the continuing issues of the breakup of at and I mean, there's many sections to the law, but the one to which, about which we are speaking. Now, that's important, because if one doesn't think about antitrust, one comes at issues in a different way. 1998, I is there anybody else here who went to Brown University? So here's the thing about oh you did so here's the thing we both know about Iron Magazine. If it weren't for him, we would have had to take grades in every course we took at Brown. <laughs> he was an original educational reformer, went on to work in the Clinton administration. 1998 released this report. What does it say? The private sector should lead. Government should avoid undue restrictions on electronic commerce. How can he say these things? Because he's looking at this, the Clinton administration, the president then, is looking at this, not from a perspective of we have to stop things. They're looking at this from a public policy that we have to promote them. And of course, there's ups and downs. There's a, down, there's a collapse of telecom in 2000, 2001. We go into a recession. But by and large, this internet idea has worked out. And so seven years after this, I wrote a paper little notice, so I appreciate the chance to talk about it today, <laughs> in which I suggested that there were some principles that government ought to think about in understanding how to conduct policy. 
Remember, what's in 2005? We have the iPod, we don't have the iPhone. We have people building up broadband connections to the home, we don't have wireless broadband, right? This is two years before the iPhone, for example, gets introduced. Four things, and I, I continue to think these are pretty sensible. I'm going to take the next few minutes to drill down on one. But first, we should incentivize investment. There has been a lot of investment, but a good governmental goal is to incent that investment. Secondly, we ought to treat people who are doing similar things similarly. That sounds sort of uh, obvious. It's a a lawyer would think of it as sort of a form of equal protection clause. What it really means is, well, you've got regulatory systems that grew up separately, and now the companies are finding themselves engaged in competition with each other. It does, the old stovepipes don't make any sense. We saw that in the early days when cable and telephone companies were rolling out broadband networks, and they were regulated under different regimes. It just didn't make any sense. We see it today even with privacy a little bit. FCC, the FTC, the White House report just coming out saying really to have a technology neutral standard, similar kinds of activities ought to be treated in the one basic approach. Okay? So that makes sense. Third, we ought to restrain market power when and if it occurs. That's my antitrust piece. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the time. I'm going to skip the other slides. But fourthly, ensure that government exercises any authority in a manner that learns and responds. I'm not going to take do this slide, but just two things I would say. So a couple of things we could do that would be really make uh, help a lot. I would suggest that all statutes and regulations be time limited. I don't mean to say they couldn't be reenacted, but it would force people to think about whether circumstances have changed. Now, the Constitution isn't time limited, so why is this a good idea? Maybe it's only a good idea in economic regulation. I don't mean civil rights statutes. I don't mean anti-discrimination statutes. But those statutes that rest on an evaluation of the nature of the marketplace, maybe they ought to have to be re-examined and re-authorized. Now, secondly, because I'm an antitrust lawyer, I think of case-by-case -case adjudication as a good way because facts actually inform problems. Uh, but let me drill down on one. And I'm going to skip these. I'm going to go to this picture. How do I think markets work? So you have a paper in front of you called the Broadband Value Circle, which goes into this in more depth. But this is my basic notion. You remember how value chains work, right? We all took some undergraduate course that taught, taught us that you know farmers raise vegetables, then they sell them to wholesales, then they sell them to processors, then they end up in cans in your kitchen. Successive firms that don't compete with each other. My basic view, this is the slide, is that what's happening, what's happened, and I'm talking about mobile broadband here, in the last few years, is that firms that had different markets of origin, that's the term I'm using at the bottom, multiple players from distinct markets of origin, could be something that was a computer company, something that was a search engine, something that was a software company, something that was a network provider, are actually all able to approach the same consumer being the lead player in the same sort of package of services and creating economic benefit surplus and therefore business arrangements. So if I'm right, the key here is to be able to approach the customer directly. Think of these companies. Look, I, this is a simple chart, right? There's lots of other companies. Apple, starting off as a computer company. Verizon, starting off as a carrier. Microsoft, a software company. Google, a search engine. Amazon, an e-commerce player. If you make it on the circle and you can start creating these kinds of packages with other, with other companies, then you can be very successful. If you don't, Nokia and Motorola, if you don't make it, then you're less successful. So. Why do I think this might be true? Um, I, I think it might be true because we see it all around us, right? We see it in the story of Apple, the iPhone, its impact on the marketplace, Google moving into different business models, uh, the, uh, Verizon, AT&T, both carrying iPhones and carrying iPhone competitors at the same time they're competing with each other. But there was actually some data. This is free cash flow analysis. I'm just going to ask you to look at the shape of the lines. But this is free cash flow analysis through the first quarter of this year. 
it's one accounting measure. It's not the only accounting measure. It, it has one, you know, these companies are multi-geography, multi-product. They um, spend money on capital, and that will d detract from free cash flow. But look at these three companies. Apple, Google, Verizon Wireless. Look at around 2005, 2006, 2007. Boom, mobile broadband comes. And what's true of all these three companies? Apple is not an upstream device manufacturer anymore. It's approaching customers directly. Google starts to take off when mobile search uh, increases around 2006 or so, becomes ubiquitous across platforms, and uh, itself becomes very successful software developer as Android rolls out and becomes a key feature across different devices. Verizon Wireless, particularly in the years it doesn't have the iPhone, finds other partners to come with, to market with packages that compete against the iPhone, like the Droid, right? So that some people might say, I like the iPhone, but I don't like that network, I like this network, maybe I'll take a device that has different characteristics. I wanted to say the Google and Verizon dips at the end, I think, are both capital investment. Right? Uh, there's an acquisition in one case and building out a network in the other. But you can see these companies, different strategies, it works. Nokia and Motorola doesn't work. Nokia, at, the, at about 2006, is the biggest seller of phones in the world. Doesn't make the transition to smartphone. Tries to. Tries to find partners. Doesn't happen. <coughs> First quarter earnings are out tomorrow. Profit warnings came out last week. It's trying to make a transition into a deal with Microsoft. Hasn't succeeded yet. Important to say yet, right? Motorola, the Razer phone comes out, hugely successful. People get to flip their phones. They love it. Pricing goes generic. There's no next act. I'm being flipped, but there's no pun intended. You know what I mean? I mean, these are great companies, right? But they don't make the transition as easily, and of course then Motorola Mobility goes into a transaction with Google. So what does this mean? Well, it means some things for business strategy. What it means is, as a matter of business strategy, what we're seeing is firms are winning when they can directly approach customers, not through intermediaries. When they can get a winning package with partners who are often simultaneously competitors, that's critical in this world. And when they can therefore bargain for a bigger percentage of the economic value they've created. Um, so what do I think that suggests? And why is that happening? There were very distinguished economists in the audience today with whom I have worked. So I'm going to do this slide very fast before they can understand what I'm saying and tell me what's wrong. <laughs> But I just want to say, there are, I've given you some anecdotes, I've given you some data. There are actual economic <coughs> principles underlying this, right? And, and I put them in four categories. Well, but the, the thing is, this market works because there's a certain amount of independence of one company from another. Open standards, right? Every email, here's the obvious example, every email goes to every other email. That's very important because it leads to the ability to mix and match. At the same time, there's interdependence. That's very important, because if we didn't have interdependence, we wouldn't have companies having to figure out how to work with each other to be able to bring packages to consumers. So it's those two factors that create the kind of mix of competition. But what happens between these companies is, of course, they have to bargain with each other to see who will get the biggest cut of the new cash flows. That's important. And there are, it, it, there are traditional economic uh, principles like network effects that will have an impact there. And finally, I don't want to lose this, there's consumers. Consumers in this world are not just passive recipients, they're active participants. Think about that. I want every one of you to look at your Facebook page the day the Facebook IPO launches and think of how much value you've contributed to that, <laughs> you and your friends, right? You are playing an active role in the creation of this marketplace. So, if all of this is true, what do I think it means? I'm just going to go to policy. I, by the way, let me just say, we could have a long conversation about video as well, 
I think over the next 18 or 24 months, we'll look carefully about video. There are implications in video that the same thing that I've described in mobile broadband could happen, but there are also some differences, namely fewer big established content players. But the one thing to look at, think about will you start buying devices that challenge the existing set top box TV? Will Apple TV appear, a real Apple TV? Uh, will you buy premium content without having to have an HBO or Showtime subscription? Would you be find that you're getting cable packages with different kinds of makeups, right? Uh, somebody in the industry said there's some consideration of maybe news and sports only for people who just want that. Okay, but what are the policy implications of this? I think it's this. If I'm right, the competition in this world of the value circle is very dynamic. And if, going back to my three-part antitrust analysis, to start with the market means one starts with the proposition that there are a lot of players coming at each other from different ways than traditional market structure or market definitions would suggest, and in a dynamic way. If that's true, then we want governmental actions that respond, that are flexible and understand the dynamic and don't try to lock in a particular moment in time. Secondly, I don't think it's possible, we need this for economic growth, right? I don't think it's possible to design rigid prescriptive rules in this world. It's the reason I believe, and there would have to be lots of changes to administrative practice, why an approach that sounds an antitrust would be a better way to think about this. Because by that I mean, I don't want to scare everybody in the world into thinking we're talking about massive section two cases of the kind of Microsoft. What I mean by sounding an antitrust is having broad principles. When an issue comes up, looking at it on its facts, collecting its facts, figuring out what the market structure is, figuring out is there real disadvantage to players in the marketplace of a kind that violates public policy, and then taking actions that are tailored to solve that problem. I think that's a good approach, and I think it dovetails with what <coughs> Anna Maria talked about as an approach to regulation. Thank you. Jonathan, let me ask something. What is the limiting case yeah. of uh, what you say? That is, <coughs> this sounds like um, <coughs> uh, using antitrust analysis to show that there really is no antitrust problem. Right. And, 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 and almost that you can't conceive of one. Right. So, so what is the limiting case? What would push you uh, right. over the line that you've drawn here? So uh, I could imagine three, maybe two and a half. Um, one would be, well, first of all, let me say, and I thank you for that question, nothing I'm saying repeals antitrust laws. So to take the easy example, if there were conspiracy, right, that would be easy, a conspiracy of competitors, simple. But let's go to the harder case of, of single firm action, which is a hard case, as we both know, under current antitrust laws. <coughs> I think there are a couple here. There's a lot of emphasis in the US and Europe now on standards, particularly where standards are created and then the terms of participation in standards has changed retroactively. I think there's nothing I've said here that would undercut an investigation into that kind of practice. Secondly, it is t fully possible under this theory that a firm could be dominant and that it could exercise its market power in an anti-competitive way. All I would suggest is that the dominance needs to be measured with an understanding of the competitive impacts from adjacent markets, rather than as much as traditional, in the way traditional antitrust usually has, looking at only the market as defined by substitutable products at the moment. I wouldn't throw that out. But I think what we're saying here is that we don't think of as a device manufacturer competing with a wireless network, for example. But if you think about what Sprint has done to enable the iPhone and the amount of commitment, financial commitments it's made, 
gee, it seems to me that some of the device manufacturers are affecting competition within wireless as much as what's going on within that. So I would simply say, Erwin, that I would ask that the aperture be open for purpose of examining dominant firm behavior, but there's nothing I'm saying that suggests it is not possible for a single firm to create a dominant position of anti competitive. I think you touched on probably the hottest issue of the last few years, net neutrality. And everything, especially when you, you know, John, in your chart, which shows that the, the pipe owners are also in the consumer servicing business, right? You showed Verizon is in the same marketplace as Apple and Google and others on that. Front. How should we understand net neutrality, Maria, maybe in the consumer perspective? And how, how did the FCC justify that? And Jonathan, maybe if you could explain it as from the antitrust perspective, too, because Whenever the, the, the pipe owners get into anything beyond distribution of pipe, there seems to be, that's a violation of net neutrality. Well, let me say this. I think, I, 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 I believe in net neutrality. I believe in the principle of net neutrality. I think there's two important questions that don't get enough attention. How should one carry out net neutrality principles and how should one think about net neutrality? Um, two points about that. I think net neutrality ought to be as much as possible on a case-by-case -case basis. Because I don't think it's possible in advance of new business models to forecast the extent to which they are pro-competitive uses in like single firms acting alone. Or, right? And, and, and so becoming overly prescriptive says we, we know what the trade-off will be. We're going to outlaw a certain kind of business model innovation because it's more negative than positive. I don't know how people make that judgment in advance. I mean, I think that's very difficult judgment. So to the maximum extent, I would rely on case by case. The second thing that this analysis would suggest, sometimes the focus is on a single firm and what it does rather than the impact of a firm's practice on a market as a whole. I think there are obviously some firm-specific actions that are just inherently wrong. I don't think it should make any difference how much market power a firm has if it defrauds customers. But there are others where people say choices are being limited. That I don't know quite how to understand that without looking about choices in the marketplace more broadly. And that would suggest that in understanding the impact of a firm's practice on net neutrality, one has to understand not just whether the firm has made a particular arrangement, but what the consequences, if any, for the marketplace as a whole. Sure. I mean, it, I think there is pretty general agreement that not blocking is a good thing. I don't particularly think there's anyone out there advocating blocking. I think beyond that, the market is still evolving dynamically. The business cases are evolving dynamically. And have, for the last 20 years or so, produced uh, a whole range of, of increasing options for consumers. And so the less you get in the way of that, I think the better. So I think minimizing regulatory intrusion on the internet is obviously a good thing. Keeping in mind that, yes, we do want legal content to make its, its way through to the end user. But that, again, I think Jonathan's prescription of looking at it case by case is probably helpful. My way of putting at it, putting it would be, you know, the vast majority, there is no problem. Let's, if we're going to into it at all, let's look at where there is a problem, which is where we get back to case by case, which kind of goes back to my diagram. Is there a problem? Are there vulnerable consumers? Is something happening that's not good for consumers? Then you might want to interfere, but I, I think the less you interfere a priori, the better, because you do want the market to continue to evolve dynamically. And with that many layers involved, as um, Jonathan's diagram illustrates, that many different parties to the market involved, um, that's a pretty complex system. The less you include it, the better it's going to, to work. Yes, ma'am, you had your hand up for one. Thank you. Uh, 
My name is Rebecca Taylor. I'm serving as an IT Belief Fellow at the State Department, and therefore, Richard, I enjoyed your comment about recursion. Um, the uh, question I have is, having participated in building pieces of this environment for the last 30 years, it strikes me often that the Internet bears a fair number of similarities with the old ham radio environments in terms of the number of participants that flow in and out of the market, the innovation that happens by moving things back and forth, in this case, between hardware and software. Um, and I really enjoyed all of your comments about how do we not break that and get in the way of letting that continue. But I'm curious, have you ever looked at any of the regulatory similarities that may exist between the way that the ham radio world was handled and the way the internet world maybe should be handled going forward? I haven't, but uh, I have not. But it's, it's an interesting good, it's a good idea. Suggestion. We should talk to you about it when, <laughs> because we should look at it. It's a good point. I mean, just to play off that, right? <coughs> we can all fall in the trap of metaphors. We've tended to talk about regulation today, uh, but as if, as if the only tradition were wireline regulation out of the old AT&T model. What your point illustrates is that there's a whole other history of regulation around wireless services, ham radio, but even the commercial uh, voice telephony, mobile telephony from the 80s and 90s, which is a different tradition, which has been more focused on promoting innovation and easy contact. And you're right, we should pay more attention to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I looked into that when I was very young, and it seems to me like in order to get a ham operator's license, I had to learn Morse code. That's not true anymore, but you used to, yes. And, and I had no interest whatsoever in technology, <laughs> <laughs> so I, just, I, didn't, I didn't go ahead with it. But I guess there is a sort of a tendency to, to memorialize historic uh, applications. I have a question about the, the uh, my name is David McCall, by the way, with BNA. I have a question about the international impact on on what you see happening in the regulatory field, especially the ITU's <coughs> efforts to, to uh, amend the ITRs that the, uh, the, in the process of going on now. Um, does that affect the way you see things playing out, uh, make you optimistic, pessimistic? Uh, it, for me, raises a lot of concerns because that would imply going back to a model that in the wireline world was not terribly successful. Um, if you look at traffic today, the traffic that was regulated, voice traffic, is a very small fraction of 1% of global IP traffic, which has <coughs> developed totally unregulated. It seems to me that there is a correlation there, that it, to that move from the regulated to the unregulated, and that attempts to impose uh, some sort of pricing along the lines of the old intercarrier regime or any, any way of trying to reshape the internet to a regulatory mode is going to be very detrimental to innovation, very de detrimental to the, the economies that are tremendously dependent these days on the success of the internet. So I am very concerned as I watch that. Uh, question for, for yeah. John, and I guess I'll open it up to <coughs> whoever, uh, either Richard or Aaron or Maria. But uh, I, I think I tend to agree with you that uh, an antitrust approach would probably be better instead of trying to anticipate problems in fast moving markets. But there's always been there, there's been two distinct kind of critiques of that. Um, and, and one is that there's been a kind of messy case law around Trico or some other cases where it's difficult at times for the courts to apply antitrust remedies in the, in, in the telecom market at least because the FCC is regulation. And now with the uncertainty about FCC regulation in the internet space and where that's moving, that might seem to be somewhat problematic. And then also that antitrust is uh, traditionally very slow moving. I know cases like John and you have been the same side on it, taking almost a decade yeah. to work themselves out of the problem. So I mean, can you address sure. from, from that? So, so here's what I mean by an antitrust-like approach. I think it's, this would be a good time to sit back and think about whether the current structure of statutes 
make sense anymore. And if one decides to redraft those statutes, then put into a statutory provision the antitrust-like approach I suggest. That solves the first problem. The first problem of Trinko, for people who haven't been reading Supreme Court decisions this morning, <laughs> has to do with the interplay of classic antitrust law with regulation. But if a new statute is passed, by definition, that problem goes away. Secondly, I don't mean by this, and I have a paper out um, that talks about this a little, that we should use antitrust litigation techniques of the kind we use, which can take decades. Well, rather, what I suggest is that we have an administrative process that focuses on the facts, that provides some basis for short-term relief, interim relief in a legal <coughs> and judicial review, so as to allow fast-moving administrative action. One. One example that's close to this is the way the FTC proceeds when it brings antitrust cases in front of uh, administrative law judges. In one case, it was going to be nine months from the filing of the case to the hearing, which is a lot faster than in a federal district court. So I, I agree with the premise that one can't simply use current antitrust law as it is, but I don't think in the world of reexamining the statute, it's hard to f create the world in which it works effectively. Okay. Go ahead, John. Yeah. How are you? Um, really, I think your, your concept of the of kind of the value circles and markets of origin is really interesting. I, had, I uh, haven't heard it put quite that way before. It's really interesting. I just had two questions about it. Um, I think your your point that you know as a business strategy. It makes the most sense to have a direct relationship with consumers. My question related to that is, do you think that the openness of the internet has kind of been a game changer there? When you think about the, the sort of the, the most recent success stories like a Pinterest or a LinkedIn or a, even an Instagram, um, it seems to me that the openness of the internet um, has allowed those companies to reach a whole new mass of consumers right away and that they were really smart in pursuing that strategy. And then sort of a second related question is, you know, you, you describe um, these players as sort of having distinct markets of origin. Um, do you think that those ma markets of origin, they matter less than they used to, given the fact that once you have your market of origin, a lot of these players in your, in your chart are actually getting into each other's spaces, using their market of origin really as kind of a foundation to go after each other's businesses and markets and so forth, and which is presumably good for competition. Yeah. So let me take both. The, your first point uh, goes back to the slide which I said it was important to be independent and interdependent. So I didn't use the terms open closed because they are so low. But an open system is where companies tend to be able to operate independently. Now look, this models, right, the Apple model is sometimes called closed, but it's a very successful one that's put a lot of innovation to so to me, the point is that both exist, so that there are various avenues that allow creativity of both kinds. So on your second point, um, there's a really interesting work that I haven't done yet to think about how firms, when firms are successful and when they're not. So uh, without, you know, picking out a particular company, we take Google. Google's first foray into devices is not successful, particularly, right? Its first foray into operating systems is hugely successful. Is that, so as an analytic matter, did it know more about software than devices? There's nothing right or wrong about that. So what I would say is, I totally agree with the premise that companies, as they move away, become less dependent on their initial market. Um, but it would be an interesting analysis to see whether their successes differ depending on how close they are to their market. With Amazon's entry into devices as a book reader was not, it seems to me, coincidental. Uh, but that's not a policy right. point. As a, from a policy point of view, I, I agree with the premise of your point, which is what their initial 
uh, existences has less relevance <coughs> to their entry into new markets. And you know, there are some people who are saying uh, that one ought to consider how the two tie together. They could tie together that way, but I think <coughs> it's easy to overstate that concern. I guess I'd like to approach it from a somewhat different angle. Um, the internet is a huge disintermediator. It is changing everyone's business plan that touches it in, in any way. And it seems to me that that makes it particularly important not to distort the economics that are underlying those businesses. So let me repeat again, I think it is very important not to have the internet non-blocking to have the ability for everyone to reach everyone else. But some of the corollaries that are in the open internet order have caused me concern, as I testified last year, because I think it is great for Amazon, for example, to be able to provide books over the internet. But it is important that it reflect the actual cost, that it not be getting a distorted free, essentially free ride for part of, of the transport um, if that the internet will destroy the US Postal Service ultimately. That ought to be because the economics of the two really are genuinely very different not because one is being artificially distorted. So that, I think, is why it, it is important not to be so in love with the ideology that we totally overlook the, the network that underlies it all. Uh, just as an FYI, uh, you mentioned Instagram. People are aware that last week Instagram was, Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars. This is a company with 13 employees. <laughs> $76 million per employee, right? But the, the value there was that, that those 13 employees had managed to build a service in 16 months that has acquired, well actually at the time that the transaction was reported, they said 25 million customers, users, their Instagram's adding a million a day, so it's actually now up to 40, and by the end of, of, of next week, they'll have more users than, say, Comcast and Netflix combined. And so the 13, the, those 13 employees have been working pretty darn hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, good standing, um, Do you see any tension between your uh, idea that government policy should be supporting the old narrow band USF uh, systems and the idea that regulators should recognize that these customers are not homogenous. It is possible that there are differences between those one third of customers who've not moved to broadband that correlate with that choice that are not simply affordability or even maybe digital literacy, maybe their true lack of value for the things that many of us do on the internet if you you know are spending four hours a day on a bus commute it doesn't leave you any leisure time to do email or video when you get home anyway you know. um let me go back to the beginning of your question i was using usf as an example of the right sort of way to approach problems like uh, lack of availability in rural areas or the inability low income. So I, I see USF as a targeted solution to some very specific problems. So let me just make sure I was clear on that. There may be a whole, there is a whole host of other issues around USF, but conceptually it is the right way to approach the need to be very limited. Um, there are obviously any number of reasons for that third of the market still having our line phone. I personally do. Um, but I think it is important for regulators to recognize that that it may be very different now, first of all, from what it was 
when the law was enacted 15 years ago. And that the way it, that many of those people do also have a wireless phone, since most Ameri almost all adult Americans do, so that in itself creates a difference. And so if there are some regulatory issues that need, there is some reason why some people still ought to have that kept available, that ought to be dealt with in a very specific way as opposed to across the board. Rate regulation of basic rates, for example. I'm not sure there is a justification anymore <coughs> for $10 basic rate, which still exists in, in some jurisdictions. Lifeline is a way of dealing with that for the folks who need it. And having it can be a real disincentive for my, against migrating to broadband, which would be perhaps a lot better for those folks. So some of the reason people still have that may have nothing to do with their preferences, but may have <coughs> everything to do with the way regulators are distorting both the service that is being provided and its pricing relative to other services. So that's why I think to the extent humanly possible, it is important to just sort of get out of the way, let the market sort itself out, and deal with specific issues like low income, like disability, like very high cost areas in very specific ways that are not going to distort <coughs> the rest of the market. Okay, that's all the time that we have today. So if anyone has additional questions, well, I can be around. You to, yeah. to Thank bring you. them directly to the speakers. And uh, thank you all for coming.